H is for homicide, the taking of lives, bloodthirsty people with pistols or knives, or government leaders that strangle their nations, and Macias Nguema killed whole populations. I'm Indy Nidell, and this is the World Dictionary, today featuring Francisco Macias Nguema. Have you not heard of him? Well, have you heard of Equatorial Guinea, where he came from? No, not that either? Well, that's okay, since it's one of the least known countries in the world, though it is like the third largest oil exporter in Africa, but it's really small. A few little facts about it though. It's the richest country per capita in Africa, but that's not the good thing it sounds like for the income is massively unequally distributed. In fact, according to the UN, fewer than half the population even has access to clean drinking water and a fifth of all children die before reaching the age of five. A very large part of that misery can be directly placed at the feet of Macias Nguema. Now, Equatorial Guinea was the only Spanish colony in Sub-Saharan Africa. It became independent in 1968, and it consisted of two parts, Rio Muni on the mainland and the volcanic island of Fernando Pu off the coast. During its last few decades as a colony, it had the lowest death rate and best medical services in Sub-Saharan Africa. So comparatively, it was flourishing, though it was a plantation economy and was rife with alcoholism, smallpox, sleeping sickness, and venereal disease. And into this land, Nguema was born. His father was a local chief and apparently a witch doctor who was beaten to death by a Spanish administrator in front of Nguema when he was nine years old. His mother committed suicide a week later and Nguema and his ten siblings were orphaned. Still, in spite of failing the civil service exam three times, he eventually became a mayor, an MP, a deputy prime minister, and in 1968 he ran for president in the only free elections ever held in Equatorial Guinea. He won and was sworn in as the nation's first president October 12th. And then things got bad. Well, it took a couple of years, but there was pretty much anywhere you'd rather be in the 1970s than Equatorial Guinea. And that includes places like Cambodia and Uganda. In 1971, he issued a decree that gave him personally all direct powers of the government. Yep. Everything that had been held by the legislative and judicial branches and the cabinet, that was all now rolled up into him. He then issued a law called Law 1 that gave the death penalty for threatening him or the government. Insulting him got you 30 years in prison. Over the next two years, he decreed himself president for life, and the Constitution of 1968 was replaced with a document that gave him absolute power. His United National Party was the only party legally allowed. He was quite paranoid, and it didn't help that he took large amounts of iboga and bang. The first is a psychedelic, and the second an edible form of cannabis. He did not trust intellectuals, so he put to death anyone who wore glasses, which, you know, that's like the surest sign, right? And you were in danger of your life for even possessing a single page of printed matter. Nguema was the chief judge, as well as president for life, sentencing thousands of people to death, and the repression of the people was entirely controlled by Nguema's relatives and clan members. Private education was subversive, so it was banned, and boats, yes, boats, were destroyed in a coastal and part island nation so his people could not flee. And in case you wonder, yes, fishing was also banned. There was exactly one road leading out of the country, and it was mined. All Western medicine was banned as being un-African, and indeed, he Africanized his name, and then the entire population had to follow suit. The island of Fernando Poole, by the way, was named Masie Nguema Biogo after his new name. Today, it is called Bioko. He gave himself titles such as Unique Miracle, and the national motto, and I'm not making this up, the national motto became, there is no other god than Macias Nguema. There was no governmental system in place under his rule for accounting, so after having the governor of the central bank killed, he took everything he could carry in suitcases and subsequently kept the national treasury under his bed in a rural village. Of course, he'd have to be in the capital sometimes, but when he left, they turned off the electricity for the capital because it was no longer necessary. On Christmas Eve 1975, he had around 150 opponents executed. This was done at the stadium in Malibu, the capital. The soldiers who executed them were all dressed as Santa Clauses and the loudspeaker was playing Those Were the Days by Mary Hopkin as they shot them down. I want you to just 
Think about that for a second. I mean, that's incredibly brutal, but it's also totally surreal. It's like like a bizarre scene of something the Joker might organize in a Batman movie, and yet it was just par for the course for Nguema. If you gotta go, go with a smile. <laughs> in spite of the lack of boats and the mined road, tens of thousands of people, especially anyone even vaguely intellectual, managed to flee the country, depending if you believe a human rights activist study in 1978 or a Time magazine study from 1979, 101,000 or up to 150,000 people had fled during Nguema's rule. Now that is from a population of around 215,000, so 47% to up to 70% of the population fled the country, and tens of thousands of people were killed as well. The country has still not recovered from the brain drain of the whole educated population either fleeing or dying. Nguema also introduced forced labor, though that did not stop cocoa production, cocoa was the main export, from declining by 5-6, which isn't surprising since there weren't a whole lot of people left around to do the producing. By 1979, the UN and the European Commission had condemned Nguema's government. Yep, by 1979, took 11 years. Anyhow, that summer, he had several family members executed, and this worried other members of the family that they were also in danger. A coup by Teodoro Obiang Nguema Mbasogo, Nguema's nephew, and a brother of one of the victims, removed Nguema from power. He was tried by a military tribunal in September, where he gave a speech outlining the extensive good deeds he had done for the nation, which... I kind of have to admit I would really love to hear. He was sentenced to death 101 times and was executed the same day of the sentencing. It only took the one time to be effective. Obiang, his successor, restored the multi-party democratic government. No, he didn't. He may not be as bad as Nguema, but he certainly hasn't been good. He too is a dictator for life and, still in power today, is the second longest serving non-royal national leader in the world. Notice though, that he wears glasses. So there has been some progress. Having said that, Nguema had ruined the economy to the point that by the 80s, foreign aid had reached 90% of the gross national product and it is still a corrupt backwater with one of the worst human rights records on earth. Oil was found offshore in 1992 though and the nation, no, actually, the family of Obiang became rich, but Obiang still carried on the political principles of his uncle. And in 2003, seriously, he declared that he was in permanent communication with God so he could kill anyone he chose without having to explain why. There have been elections, but he wins them with up to 99.9% .9 of the vote. That number may be influenced by the fact that the ballots are not secret, and an opposition leader was sentenced to 101 years in prison for being an opposition leader. But today is not about him, it's about his uncle Nguema. So, to the dick scale. His achievements. On the plus side, he did work as a civil servant and did manage to win an election for the presidency, the first one his nation had. Uh, on the downside, he destroyed his nation's economy, even banning things like fishing. Uh, he introduced forced labor, he destroyed his nation's entire intellectual population, seriously jeopardizing its future. Um, that is most definitely a three on the scale of bad ones. As for being a dick, yes, he sentenced thousands of people to death and all, but leaving out everything else, I think just having Santa Clauses as a firing squad, executing 150 people at Christmas while those were the days played, makes you without question an absolute and irredeemable dick. In fact, dictators really need a separate scale from other types of dicks, something that covers things like oppression, mass murder, warmongering, dictatorial competence, threats to the world, things kind of specific to dictators. And we'll make that up for the future, but let's just say now, Nguema maxes out our usual scale and was certainly more of a dick than other first-class dicks we've covered. But hey, with him gone, at least now some people can wear glasses there. That's it for today. If you know of any dicks throughout history that we should talk about, let us know who they are in the comments and tell us why. In fact, today's dick was a suggestion from one of you guys, Corned Beef. So thank you, Corned Beef. Now remember, living people do not count. And please, support us on Patreon so we can continue to produce the dictionary. Don't forget to subscribe and never miss a single letter of the alphabet. And hey, don't be a dick.